Hmm. I died when I was 15 years old. I drowned out in the ocean. I came across this interview on the YouTube channel NDE Accounts Near Death Experiences called Life is a Stage Play. And the original video is about 26 minutes long, so I've cut a lot of it out for the sake of time. I would recommend watching the video in full as well. To give some background on near-death experiences, the University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies has been researching them for over 50 years, and their conclusions suggest that consciousness may indeed survive bodily death and that mind and brain appear to be distinct and separable. Princeton's PEAR program studied consciousness for nearly 30 years and concluded that we need a better understanding of the role of consciousness in the establishment of physical reality. They studied remote perception, also known as remote viewing, and found a probability against chance of approximately three parts in 10 billion, demonstrating that there clearly is mainstream research indicating that experiences of this nature are indeed real. The way this man describes the mechanics of the simulation are consistent with Tom Campbell's big theory of everything simulation model. At this point of the interview, he was well aware that he would not be surviving the constant barrage of waves that would crash on his head and send him to the bottom of the ocean. Literally relived my life at that point. Only 15 years of it, but relived the whole thing. That's how much time slowed down. I went down for the last time and I knew it was. I, I just didn't have the energy. There was no energy left in me to fight it. And at that point, this incredible, profound, sense of peace overcame me. Somehow I had this sense that I was going to be okay. No harm was going to come to me. Distinctly a feeling that I was loved, which begged the question, by whom? You could have asked me any given moment in my life, because I just relived it, but you could have asked me any given moment in any person's life on that planet, and I could have told you. All of that information was right there. It was available. Not just any person living there now, any person that had ever lived there or ever would live there. All that information is all available. It's right there. And what kept going through my mind at this point was, oh, of course. I was, if you will, remembering what I had forgotten very intentionally in order to be on this planet, which is what we all do. In point of fact, I don't think that this planet exists. It's a figment of our imagination, if you will, and we have a very good imagination. We're incredibly creative beings. But whether or not it's for real doesn't really matter. The truth of the matter is, is that we know things when we're not here that we for choose to forget while we are here. You know everything about what your life's going to be like here. From beginning to end, you knew it before you got here, and you will know it again when you leave here. But while you're here, you're focused on it. And you're focused on each given moment in it. And when you leave here, it all comes rushing back, and you say, of course. That, and it's all so simple. What is your life like when you're not here? If you try to define it, you run into problems, because it is so simple that it's best described in English as this you are. The minute you say anything other than that, you're talking about something earthly. We don't have English for other things. And probably more important, everything there is simpler than what it is here, not more complicated. At that moment, I no longer had any awareness of any of my senses. I didn't have a body. I didn't see anything. I could picture the earth in my mind, but I didn't see the earth. I didn't see blackness. You don't, th that's seeing something. I saw nothing. There was no sight. There was no touch. There was no taste. There was no smell. There was no feel. Didn't have any of those senses at all. And yet, my brain was functioning. My brain, my mind was functioning. That which occupies my brain was functioning. So your sixth sense is still working very well. I say still working because your sixth sense is working while you're here. It's one of the things that you choose to ignore to be here. You choose to because it makes the experience of being here have more depth, more intensity, if you will. It takes on a more realistic 
look to it. So people have often asked me, how do you become psychic? And I just have to laugh. No, no, you don't become psychic. You are psychic. You forget that you're psychic. You let go of your senses here and your sixth sense is still right there and you have got it at all times. And it is not something that you do. It's that you stop doing this. So people look to try to figure things out psychically and they think there's some effort you have to make. No, you stop making an effort. It's the exact opposite of what you would expect. You stop thinking about focusing here. You stop thinking about your sensory input here. You stop thinking about a whole frame of reference of being here. Meditation is wonderful for this. It centers you, if you will, in source. You let go. Basically, people, when they tell you, tell you to meditate, they'll say, you just sit in one place, close your eyes, try and just ignore all sensory input and say, I am. Excellent. That is source. Very definitely. And don't be too terribly disappointed if you find that you cannot turn on the psychic charms and become the world's renowned psychic overnight because you lose a lot of depth of what's going on here if you choose to do that. For the moment, back to where I was. I'm out in space and I'm looking at the earth and I'm knowing what's going on with everybody's life in it. And then because everybody has always told me and I'm still somewhat referencing things, of course, but in earthly terms, I'm looking at it saying, well, I guess it's time for me to move on and go to the other place. So in my mind, I pictured turning away from the earth and going out into space. In point of fact, I did not do go anywhere. I was not in a space. I was not out in space. I did not head for some planet. That's the way I pictured it in my mind because all of a sudden all your senses are cut off and you feel very disoriented. So you try to reference things in a way that you're accustomed to. Of course, you're wondering, where am I going next? I don't have a direction. I don't know that I'm in space. I don't know where I would travel to if I was. So where is it I'm going? And at this point, the expression, the white light in the tunnel plays in. Now, mind you, you don't have any senses. You don't see anything. You don't hear anything. You don't smell anything. You don't have any space and time. Nothing exists as far as that goes. For you to go through a tunnel is patently absurd. But how else do you describe what is a psychological tunnel, very definitely? Because all of your input's just gotten cut off. Not all of it. I sensed that I was loved. I sensed that I would be fine. Where is that coming from and how do I go to that? And of course, when you first start thinking about that, it is a it's an idea. It's a feeling and an idea that has no space and time, no location, but you want to go to it. Well, initially, that's a very small thing, if you will. And yet, as you try to turn your focus on it, and I don't mean your visual focus, but you focus your mind on that and wanting to go there, it becomes bigger. And so it's as if it is a little ray of light off in the distance with dark all around it, which could easily be described as a tunnel. But it is a psychological tunnel. And it is a tunnel. Your input just all got cut off except one little bit of input. And it's very profound, but it's relatively small. It somehow seems distant, although it seems to be getting closer. Because with all your other input cut off, you focus on it more. It's the only thing you have left to focus upon. And so you, if you will, move through the tunnel and towards the light. I won't say that you're greeted there by some people who walk up and, how you doing, Fred, and shake your hand. No. There's no bodies there. There can be. You can picture them that way. You pictured them here, and you can picture them there if you want to. This gets really confusing because we are creating our reality here on this planet. Every last bit of it, we're creating it in our mind. Our images that we create are all our images, and science is starting to bear this out. The quantum physicist will tell you, you look at water and you change its molecular structure. But you're creating your reality here. If I was going to try to describe what I believe we are at our source, 
what we are like. We are extremely creative beings. We can sit and do absolutely nothing and be as little as possible if we want to, but it just doesn't seem to be in our nature. We like to create things. And if you made the analogy that your, your life was like a movie that you made, where you picked all of the characters and the actors to play in your movie and you wrote the script out and said this is what I want to have happen and how I want it to be, that would be a very good analogy. And that's where it gets really interesting because from this perspective we're very much used to the idea of looking at things and judging things. I like that. I don't like that. So we say this is good and we say this is bad. And we, of course, assume that there is a universal good and bad out there. I agree there's a universal good and bad out there, but here's the strange twist to it, is that the universal part of it is the fact that good is what you like and bad is what you don't like, and it's different for everybody. And that's where life gets really strange. Because people then say, well, but there's no universal good or evil. No, there isn't. Well, what about... The guy who kills people. What would you tell me about the actor in the movie who plays the serial killer and goes through the movie killing a series of people? Is he a bad person? No, you have judged the character that he plays as a bad person. Did anybody really die? No. You got caught up in the story and decided to believe that killing people was bad to experience the drama of the whole thing. Well, what about good and bad? There aren't any. That sounds kind of harsh and really twisted from what most people think because we're all pretty much brought up to believe that there are good things and bad things in life. Well, that's true from any given perspective, but not universally. If this is all a stage play and none of it's real, none of it truly exists except in our minds, and we are all co-authoring each other's plays as well as our own, and getting together and putting this play together, then what happens here is all an experiment in what it's like to focus on a given set of circumstances of our own making, and it's okay. Doesn't make any difference how it turns out. Doesn't make any difference what you do. You came here to experience those things. Well, it has the distinct disadvantage that you don't get to blame everything that's gone wrong in your life on God or the devil or whoever it is you want to try to put in that little slot if in point of fact you're the author of it all and that you agreed to it all long before you came here it has the distinct advantage that you can never be a victim unless you chose to be one and even then you aren't truly a victim you're experiencing what it feels like to be one but you aren't this has got a real distinct advantage to it if you think about it because you have nothing to fear, which is a lot better way to live your life than running around scared all the time that you could become a victim. There are things out there that could happen to you that are beyond your control. Well, in the first place, what I experience tells me that that's not the case. But just as a practical matter here, we both hope that that's not the case because if it is, you could be a victim. And in my world, I can't be. Which world would you rather live in? Now, these things were obvious to me when I was there. No, I didn't get mad at, mad at the, the pearly gates. No, I wasn't in heaven. No, I wasn't in hell. No, I wasn't in purgatory. I was in a wonderful place. I felt completely loved. I was in touch with a vast array of other beings. I was part of it. They were part of me. We're all one. If I was going to try to address the question of whether or not there is a God, I would say to you that if there is a God, first off, what you're doing in your playtime on this playground, he doesn't care about any more than your mom worries about what it is you're doing on a playground if you're simply out there playing a, a game of ball and nobody's getting hurt and there's no problems. She didn't care about every little detail and it doesn't make any difference whether you hit the ball directly into center field or off into left field doesn't matter. Similarly, if there's a God in the universe, I would describe it this way. It's like 
we're all branches and leaves on a tree and God would be the root. And the tree don't worry too much about where the leaves are blowing.